Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President for Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this uh, joint event between CSIS and the Peterson Institute for International Economics on supply chain uh, relocation, uh, supply chain relocation to Mexico and North American economic competitiveness. Um, we're just tremendously um, thrilled to be doing this with our um, friends and partners at uh, the Peterson Institute. Um, the, this topic of, well, two topics, supply chains and China, are very hot topics in Washington these days. A little less hot is the question of um, Mexico and its uh, role in supply chains and in uh, the potential reshoring or nearshoring uh, from China of production. Um, and so, uh, this is a really interesting and important topic, one that doesn't get enough discussion in Washington. And we're delighted that we were able to bring together a, a group of experts um, who give a sort of 360 degree perspective on uh, these questions uh, from Peterson, from CSIS and from outside. And we're just delighted in a second, I'm gonna introduce uh, my colleague, Ryan Berg, who is senior fellow in our Americas program uh, but let me first uh, hand to our uh, partner in crime here, uh, Dr. Adam Posen, who's a well-known figure here in Washington um, and is uh, the co-organizer of this effort. And so over to you, Adam. Thank you, Matt. And thanks to all of our colleagues at both CSIS and PIIE. Um, and we're grateful as well to Chubb uh, Insurance for funding this effort which was, of course, we're proud to have Evan Greenberg as a member of the board of directors of both CSIS and PIIE. I, I think the contribution we're trying to make today is not so much to tell you that if Mexico were in some liberal neocon fantasy, a perfect market, then it would be a obvious no brainer for the US to put production there. The question is more, how do we get from where we are now 
to a much more vibrant, resilient, integrated North American economy, which is clearly in both countries' interests. And so this is the start of what we hope will be some additional research and prescription, not just to point out, wow, it would be better if we're choosing places to make supply chains more resilient. Wouldn't it be great to be in Mexico? It's what practically can the US and Mexican governments do to create a business environment that would make it make sense for this to happen. This obviously has both foreign policy and economic aspects, which is why we're delighted to be partnering again with CSIS. This has been a recurrent effort on the part of both teams, not an effort because it's a struggle, but an effort because we try to get that dreaded word synergy. And in this case, I think we have done so quite well. Finally, let me just say there are going to be some harsh words, not by my colleagues, but implied by them for both the US and the Mexican governments. The Biden administration seems to have set its sights on Mexico not very differently than the Trump administration did, focusing on the perceived threat of migration, focusing on NAFTA as a bad thing. And this is silly, frankly, and self-defeating. There are ways in which NAFTA 2.0 has improved on labor and environmental standards, and that should be the basis for doing more together, not the basis for saying, well, now we can forget about Mexico. Similarly, the Mexican government, while totally within its rights to maintain its independence and for that matter to go in a left wing direction, this is not an issue. What is an issue is the remaining unreality of certain policies pursued by the AMLO government that are hostile to foreign direct investment and hostile to constructive binding of networks once we get out of the labor markets. So there is a practical agenda here, and I'm very proud that CSIS and PIIE scholars have allowed us to say what are real steps that both Washington and Mexico City can take. With that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Ryan Burke. Thank you very much, Dr. Posen, Mr. Goodman, for the introductory remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Berg. I'm a senior fellow with the Americas program at CSIS. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on supply chain relocation to Mexico and North American economic competitiveness. Before we formally begin, I want to lay the groundwork for the rest of this morning's event. This event will last until approximately 1030 Eastern time. Following the panelists' opening remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. We ask our audience to please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. I would like to thank, to take a moment to thank our partners at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and in particular, the Peterson Institute Meetings Department for working closely with the CSIS Americas and economics programs to make today's event a success. I would also like to take a moment to thank Chubb for the generous contribution and support in making this event possible. Again, good morning. There is a growing policy preference for at least partial economic decoupling from China and nearshoring of supply chains to the Western Hemisphere, principally to Central America and to Mexico. Significant concerns remain, however, over Mexico's viability as a nearshoring partner in this endeavor. Despite the seeming feasibility of nearshoring to Mexico, given close geographic and economic ties, as well as a robust trading framework embodied in the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, many structural and policy barriers continue to deter investors from engaging further in Mexico. Private investors and government partners continue to question Mexico's competitiveness as compared to other potential nearshoring destinations. The stability of Mexico's investment climate and the negative impact Mexico's political climate could possibly have in the short, medium, and perhaps even in the long term. Over the past four months, experts from the Center for Strategic and International Studies and PIIE have collaborated to produce a compendium of short, substantive essays to address these concerns and the issues involved, along with a set of practical policy recommendations. And that was just released last night in conjunction with this event. And so I encourage our uh, viewers today to go and check out the publication as well. Each of our panelists today was a contributing author in this project and will share insights from their research in their remarks. Our distinguished panel today includes experts on Mexico, China, 
North American trade policy, supply chain relocation, protectionism, and globalization. Together, we will address the prospects for supply chain relocation to Mexico and increasing North American economic competitiveness. Our first panelist is Dr. Luis de la Calle, Managing Director and Founding Partner at De La Calle Madrazo Mancera SC. Dr. De La Calle previously represented Mexico at the World Trade Organization as Undersecretary of International Business Negotiations at the Mexican Ministry of the Economy. He also participated actively in the design, promotion, and implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Our second panelist this morning is Ms. Mariana Campero, Senior Associate with the Americas Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and host of the CSIS Mexico Matters podcast. Ms. Campero was previously the CEO of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, COMEXI. She is an expert on Mexican domestic and foreign policy, as well as North American business and investment trends. Our third panelist is Mr. Jeffrey J. Schott, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Mr. Schott is an expert with over 45 years of experience as a researcher, a professor, and an author on international trade and energy policy. He is an expert on Mexico, NAFTA, as well as regional trade agreements. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Mary E. Lovely, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Dr. Lovely has more than three decades of experience as a researcher and professor of international economics, most recently as professor of economics and Melvin A. Eggers faculty scholar at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Her expertise is in Chinese trade and foreign direct investment policy, trade protectionism, and multinational corporations. Because of the constraints of this virtual event format, I would also like to take a moment before we begin, our, be, we begin our panel to recognize those authors who contributed to this project, but who were unable to participate in the event today. We extend our deepest thanks, therefore, to David Shu, former research analyst with the Peterson Institute of International Economics, Sherman, Robert, or Sherman Robinson, non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, Raul Inojosa Ojeda, Associate Professor in the UCLA Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, and Ambassador Tony Wayne, Career Ambassador and Senior Advisor with the CSIS Project on Prosperity and Development. Thank you all for your analysis, recommendations, and other contributions to this compendium. Our panelists today will frame the conversation by discussing the U.S. and Mexico's common interest in nearshoring, Mexico's current viability as a nearshoring partner, and policy steps that could encourage investment in and nearshoring to Mexico. Dr. De La Calle, over to you for your opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that very kind uh, introduction, for the invitation. Thanks to uh, CSIS, to the Pearson Institute. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm honored to be invited to participate in this and, of course, to be with uh, my good friends Mariana, Mary, and, and Jeff. Um, I will just briefly say two things. One, the first one is, is there a reason to be optimistic about Mexico? And, and the answer to, to that is yes. Um, why? Well, because uh, in the last 10 years, we have seen a significant improvement in the productivity of Mexican firms. I mean, before COVID, before Lop Salvador, if you look at statistics, how much Mexican firms were improving in the ways that are were producing, selling, sourcing, um, integrating themselves to the uh, modern economy, growing, investing, becoming many of them multinationals. That story is happening, is well underreported in the media. We're still there, and Mexico is going to go back to that after COVID. Reason number two is that even in the difficult circumstances we're living in, Mexico looks pretty solid compared to the rest of Latin America. Brazil, even Chile now has trouble. Uh, Argentina, I mean, uh, Colombia was also a start, has some running into troubles of late. So Mexico, even with the local Salvador administration, looks quite solid in terms of its macroeconomic policies. I mean, we have relatively decent uh, public finances, low debt to GDP ratio levels. Uh, we have, of course, USMCA, we have an independent central bank. 
A third reason why there is optimism about Mexico is that uh, the diversification of Chinese risk by manufacturing firms is something that is happening. Uh, it's long-term, it's structural. It's not like uh, the fashion of the year, but it, it will last few years. Now, the problem is that Mexico is not taking fully advantage of these opportunities. Uh, and, and the reason for that is a combination of uh, uh, lack of vision, uh, lack of policy determination, uh, ideological incompetence, and just incompetence. Uh, and, and let me tell you the areas where I think Mexico could improve to position itself to really take advantage of this structural change in the sense that uh, there will be less investment in China and more investment elsewhere in the next 20 years. China is changing also its economic policy. So the uh, shift in economic policy in China has consequences uh, everywhere. And Mexico is, of course, one of the best candidates to play a role in this diversification of Chinese risk. Now, for to, to really take advantage of that, we need to work on uh, four areas. Area number one is logistics. Logistics means, of course, improving border crossing, more bridges, more um, lanes for trucks and uh, more rail uh, with, with the U.S. There's a huge role to be played, and, and that's what um, Sherman Robinson and uh, Raul Hinojosa mentioned in the other uh, chapter by NetBank, expanding NetBank into transportation infrastructure at the border and outside the border, I think is very important. But in Mexico needs to improve its uh, ports, its airports, its rail system, the integration of the, uh, a true North American rail system uh, through Kansas City uh, and Canadian uh, Pacific, uh, an important uh, initiative on that front, etc. Well, unfortunately, in the last few years, Mexico is sending signals that uh, logistics is not something that we're very interested in. We canceled a large airport for Mexico City for no reason other than politics. Uh, there's been um, uh, blockage, blockades of uh, rail, important rail lines in Mexico out of the port of Lázaro Cárdenas. Now that you have a, a, a LA Long Beach clogged with uh, ships, we are blocking a rail coming out of the uh, uh, Lázaro Cárdenas that competes with the LA Long Beach. It's just complete madness. Second thing, uh, in order to compete successfully with China, we need to integrate more North American value. And the way to do that is not through the rules of origin that were proposed in USMCA or, for that matter, NAFTA, but by having an integrated energy uh, market with cheap natural gas and other sources of energy in the whole of North America. Mexico is industrially very competitive today. I mean, we compete head on with China in many sectors. Sometimes we lose market share, sometimes we gain market share. But I mean, uh, just getting 0.5% in the U.S. market share is a tremendously large. So we shouldn't minimize the marginal gains we make. Uh, and we're doing that with an energy sector, an energy market that is not integrated. If we have an energy integration in North America, Mexico's industrial development will be unstoppable. And, and, and the government in Mexico is trying to uh, put the brakes or go back into a system where there is no competition in uh, the energy sector. I mean, the, sector, the government would like to have monopoly for the uh, power company from the government and the, uh, energy, the hydrocarbons company, Pemex, for the Mexican government with that, without competition. The government, Mexican government fails to realize that it's much better to have Pemex and Shell and BP and Exxon and Chevron and many others, also many Mexicans, by the way, and same thing on the power side. Because if we have that, then the integration of North American value would be much higher. And, and the ability to integrate, the reason China is successful is that in China, you have vertically integrated supply chains. And in, in, in North America, we don't develop the, all the uh, links to the uh, supply chain. It will be very difficult to compete successfully with China. And the key to that is, of course, the development of the uh, natural gas and its derivatives. Um, petrochemicals, um, synthetic fibers, steel, glass, all the things that are gas intensive. Third thing, competition with China is about technology. And if Mexico is truly serious about participating in 
uh, competing uh, with China in the North American context, Mexico has to become a, a linchpin on technological development and, and, and supply North America the talent, the engineers, the nurses, the uh, researchers, the young talents that we do have in Mexico, but we need to push forward. Well, unfortunately, in the Lopes Obrador administration, there is an anti-science, anti-technology, anti-modernization uh, of the economy uh, agenda that makes that more difficult. So even though it's happening, because we you, you see very sophisticated factories opening in Mexico in the uh, aerospace business, for instance, in the defense business, uh, very successful. We could do much more if we were investing in talent and pushing for research and development and uh, uh, protection of intellectual property rights and many other things to push for um, for this. But uh, molecular biology, for instance, medical devices. I mean, medical devices is tremendously important, and, and COVID has shown that Mexico is a, a, a trusted, trusted partner on that. And finally, the fight with China is not only about technology, but it's also about the, uh, the capitalism of the 21st century. Do we want a capitalism based on the state running the show? That's, that's where uh, President Xi is going. Or we want a capitalism that is diffused in terms of its ability to produce ideas, uh, and, and that has to be based on, on, on a de democratic values and the rule of law. Um, so Mexico to truly be an alternative in terms of economic integration and uh, taking advantage of diversification of Chinese risk has to become a modern country. And that means uh, making sure that we see the rule of law, not something that is necessary for justice, but also that is uh, absolutely essential for a comparative advantage for North America. I'll stop right there, Brian, and I'm glad to be with you. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, uh, Dr. De La Calle. Ms. Mariana Campero, your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Ryan, and it is a true pleasure for me to be here, surrounded by so many experts. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as Luis said, given Mexico's proximity to the United States, its lower labor costs, its existing manufacturing base, and a revamped North American Free Trade Agreement, the country should be reaping the benefits of nearshoring of production away from China. Yet, these incentives have not been enough for companies to include Mexico high on their lists as they think about supply chain diversification and resiliency. In fact, last year, the value of new greenfield foreign investment in Mexico dropped and private investment fell to only 19% of GDP from 23% in 2018. There is not only one reason for why investments are low in Mexico. According to some experts, the country's low economic growth, the lack of rule of law, as Luis mentioned, corruption, insufficient infrastructure, logistics infrastructure, and security are are among the key factors that weigh on the country as it competes to attract investments. Yet, despite all of this, until very recently, Mexico was one of the 25 most attractive countries in the world for foreign investors, according to an index compiled by A.T. Carney. This year, for the second consecutive year, Mexico was removed from this list. Investors certainly fear uncertainty and private investments dropped significantly after the cancellation of the Mexico City Airport project, which would, which would have quadrupled Mexico's capacity. Since then, the current government has changed laws, economic regulations, removed checks on the executive, cut funding for the judiciary and some independent watchdogs. He has cut jobs and salaries for civil servants, has substituted hundreds of technocrats with party loyalties, and in tandem has strengthened the armed forces. However, particularly worrisome to national and international investors is AMLO's energy nationalism and the policies of self-sufficiency that Luis described. He's pushing, as we know, for a counter-reform that would put the state in control of the whole industry. According to Ambassador Lighthizer, whom I interviewed for the Mexico Matters podcast, which will be released on Monday, uh, on Friday, 
some of the technical elements of this reform are in violation of USMCA. They also violate Mexico's environmental commitments. If passed, Mexico's electricity will belong to the state, including generation, distribution, and supply. And CFE, the state utility, would be guaranteed at 54% of the market. This reform also affects mining and other value chain investments. Private companies would still be allowed to participate, but will no longer be able to sell directly to private manufacturers, but rather into the grid, which will no longer buy according to the lowest price. In fact, the national electric grid would prioritize electricity purchases from the CFE, affecting billions of private investments in wind and solar energy, as well as in hydrocarbons. The new law, if approved, will make electricity more expensive, dirtier, and less re reliable, unfortunately hindering Mexican manufacturing competitiveness and increasing the carbon footprint of products produced in Mexico. Undoubtedly, Mexico needs the United States, but Washington also needs Mexico. The current trajectory is not only hindering Mexico's, Mexico's ability to grow and offer opportunities for our people, but it is also hurting billions in investments and the possibility of building integrated North American supply chains. I believe the U.S. has tools and a lot of leverage to use in order to find a mutually beneficial outcome. It has certainly done it before. First, it has USMCA. The U.S. private sector and, and various organizations have asked USDR to call Mexico to order and use the tools in USMCA to guarantee enforcement. In this, there are two ways. One is the investor state dispute settlement mechanism that was not eliminated in the energy area. There is, this, there is an ISDS process that can go forward and companies with contracts with the Mexican government in these areas and that have been affected can enforce the rights to arbitration. And second, there is a state to state mechanism and this is up to the Biden administration, they will have to decide whether to bring Mexico to a process in case, of course, this reform passes. Second, during the high-level economic conference, Marcelo Obrad, our foreign minister, said that Lopez Obrador had proposed a meeting with President Biden. A direct leader-to-leader -leader conversation might just be the method necessary to artic articulate the U.S. concerns and offer a, pre a quid pro quo focused on protecting the environment and U.S. investments. In exchange, the Biden administration could offer temporary work visas to Central America that AMLO has asked for, or additional vaccine doses that are still needed in Mexico. Whatever the tools used, as Juan Gonzalez, U.S. National Security Council said, there is, Mexico is present and works in every U.S. government agency works with Mexico, yet no one really owns it. Having an overarching strategy set by the White House, but managed by a single U.S. government agency responsible for the overall relationship might offer better results. I believe it is in the interest of both. Thank you very much for, for this invitation. And I pass it back to you, Ryan. Thank you very much for your remarks, Mariana. Uh, Mr. Jeff Schott, good morning. Your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel with old friends and new friends. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed the presentations by Luis and Mariana so far. Uh, they uh, have spelled out the opportunity for Mexico. Uh, but the door is, while the door is open, uh, you have to take the steps to walk through it. And so my short presentation this morning is on the challenges, uh, because uh, firms uh, thinking about diversifying from China are now considering whether to shift to uh, out of Asia, uh, shorten the supply chains uh, for uh, serving the U.S. market. And as Luis said, uh, Mexico seems like the logical, natural choice for nearshoring. Uh, and the USMCA seems like uh, the uh, tool to remove policy, uh, concerns about policy predictability and provide a uh, uh, 
some uh, guidance and uh, uh, roadmap for, for moving forward. Uh, but uh, there are significant obstacles. And so uh, Mexico faces competition, not only from Asian countries, uh, and, and not only with regard to other countries in Latin America, but it faces competition from the United States. Uh, because one of the uh, uh, options, uh, which is strongly called for by many members of the U.S. Congress, is to have the investments reshore to the United States uh, because they want the jobs in their districts. So what uh, my short piece tries to do is, is look at three questions. How does Mexico compare to its main competitors in Asia and North America? Uh, has foreign direct investment begun to shift, particularly in manufacturing? And of course, Mariana has already noted that there has been a decline in greenfield investment. Uh, and third, does the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the USMCA, help as advertised? And the short answer is not so well, not so much, and not really. And so there's a big challenge ahead for Mexico. So the first point on how does it compare with its uh, with other countries? When companies plan their production and trade strategies, they benchmark their strengths and weaknesses against key competitors. Countries whose economic development depends on trade and foreign direct investment should do the same. And so I looked at a number of indices that have been compiled by international organizations and uh, business firms <clears throat> to look at indicators across a, a range of uh, areas, business regulations, infrastructure, international trade ties, and corruption to see how uh, Mexico uh, ranks with, uh, with countries in North America and in Asia. Overall, uh, these indicators place Mexico in the middle of the pack uh, of the 120 to 180 countries covered in the surveys. But in the bottom third of countries examined in the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, and this was indeed a, uh, a concern uh, raised by both Luis and Mariana. Uh, this leads to uh, uh, a problem because many country, many companies will look in leaving Mexico, uh, leaving China to move into Asia uh, to maintain uh, the strength of the supply chains that they have there and to benefit from the new free trade agreements that have been developed between China and ASEAN and other countries in the region and the newly uh, uh, launched uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership. Uh, that provides substantial advantages in, in doing business and, and sourcing within Asia. This puts Mexico at a disadvantage, and uh, uh, I think there is a need to, to, to uh, think about how you need to compete with those countries uh, and uh, do many of the things that Luis and Mariana uh, were talking about, uh, the homework that Mexico needs to do to uh, improve its international competitiveness. Second point, has there been much in, uh, foreign direct investment coming into Mexico? Uh, the flows continue to come in in the financial sector uh, and financial services. Uh, but in manufacturing, foreign direct investment over the past three years has been generally flat. Uh, one can uh, sort of take it with a grain of salt to decline in, in 2020 because of the pandemic, but there hasn't been a big recovery or, or substantial growth. Uh, the, uh, the bulk of foreign direct investment in Mexico in manufacturing is in transportation equipment, uh, cars, trucks, and parts. Uh, that covers about 46% of total Mexican foreign direct investment in manufacturing uh, and most of it comes from North America and, and Europe. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of that was designed and the USMCA was designed to maintain competitiveness and strengthen investment incentives to invest in the transportation uh, system and production 
uh, in North America. But the uh, the the hoped for advantages coming out of the revised NAFTA, the USMCA, have proven to be uh, ephemeral. Uh, in, instead of improving the competitiveness of uh, North American production, uh, the USMCA hailed for removing the cloud of uncertainty about the future of regional economic integration has actually cast a big new cloud over the production of cars, trucks, and parts. Uh, and that happened after the fact, even though many of us warned, Mary and I warned uh, well before the, the agreement was signed, that this was a troubling area and would lead to increased production costs in North America and spur an increase in imports into the region rather than increased production. Uh, the, uh, in the summer of 2020, the United States issued new regulations. Uh, to implement the domestic content requirements uh, for implementing these, these uh, preferences under the USMCA. And they turned out to be a lot different than what the uh, companies uh, producing in North America and the Mexican government officials had expected. Uh, and this seeming double cross, which continues to this day, has put a big cloud over production and has, uh, has led to uh, concerns and question marks uh, about the viability of new investments uh, in the transportation sector and whether there will need to be over time a, divest a divestment of, uh, uh, from Mexico back into the United States uh, because of the requirements of the US regulations. This is a big problem. Uh, it's a cause on the US side uh, but it, it, it comes at the same time that the Mexican government is undertaking policies that are undermining or, or in, uh, uh, in, impeding their, uh, the ability of Mexican firms to compete aggressively in the global market. So uh, this is an area where uh, Mexico has to do more. It's an area where the United States has to do more. And Luis mentioned how the NAD Bank, uh, which was developed at the start of the NAFTA era uh, to promote economic development on both sides of their border, needs to expand both in resources and the scope of its operations. And the uh, chapter by Sherman Robinson and Raul Hinojosa Ojeda in, in, uh, in the briefing uh, spells out some of the important areas that where the United States could be working hand in glove with the Mexican business and government officials uh, to strengthen Mexican production for the benefit of uh, all companies in North America. That's the model we should be looking at, but it takes a, uh, an enlightened perspective from Washington and Mexico City to do that. Uh, and so far, we're, we're seeing very limited uh, progress in that area. So I'll leave it at there on that unfortunately somber note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your opening remarks. Last but not least, Dr. Mary Lovely, thank you very much for being with us this morning. The floor is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you, Ryan. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be part of this team. As someone who has spent 20 years studying China and Asia and U.S. integration with China and Asia, um, it was, of course, interesting to see the movement of foreign investment uh, from uh, diverting from China to other parts of Asia, particularly Vietnam, Malaysia. And um, then with this project to sit back and say, why isn't it coming to Mexico? As an American, not as a researcher, but more as a citizen, one says, isn't this an important thing for us to think about in terms of stability and growth in our own region? And yet we see that there's enormous barriers to that being done, um, which frankly, you know, you have to think there has to be a better way. Um, my contribution to this um, volume, and I do recommend the many interesting papers that are in this volume, uh, which cover a wide range of issues. My contribution was really more narrow. What I wanted to look at was, um, given that under the Trump administration, we had a very unexpected but deep trade war with China, what was the impact of that for Mexico? Um, let me explain just a little bit about why this is an interesting question to ask. We know that um, China and Mexico compete in many areas. 
Uh, some of those are areas that are mainly uh, domestic activities, they're uh, pr production mainly by domestic producers, but also in many areas that are mediated by multinational firms and part of global value chains. If we look just at U.S. imports from China, we see that 60% of U.S. imports from China are coming from foreign invested enterprises operating in China, which tells you that that is part of global value chain trade. Also, we look at particular areas which are important not only to the U.S.-China trade flows, but to U.S.-Mexico, including um, electrical equipment or computer and electronic devices. And we see that more than 75% of those products in some areas are coming from foreign invested enterprises or our pro so-called processing trade, which means they are clearly labeled as part of global value chains. So these global value chain trade is really key to the U.S.-China relationship, and it can and should be part key to the U.S.-Mexico relationship, given uh, not only the proximity, but also the um, our overarching framework provided by the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement. So the U.S. Uh, trade war with China provided a kind of natural experiment of the, of the following sort. Suppose we raise China's costs by 25 percent. What would that do? In, 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 a, in, a, in a sense, we're asking how much is the competitive advantage, a disadvantage that Mexico has vis-a-vis -vis China? If we artificially raise the cost of doing business with China, do we see um, you know, uh, global value chain shift. Now, there is a limit, which is that we haven't had a lot of time to observe these changes, and we know that supply changes take time, both to develop, to develop and to move, and I'll come back to that very briefly at the end. So let me just share my slides, um, hopefully successfully. <laughs> How is, oh no, um, did I not do that right? Ryan, can you see them? <laughs> You're I seeing see, the wrong I screen. See your, I see your screen, Dr. Lovely. Why don't we have? Okay. Uh, why don't we have Isaac? How's this? Can you see it now? Okay. That's what I thought I did. Um. Okay, why don't you guys just share them? Sorry, it's Teams, I'm not finding it. It's up, but there, there we, go. we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so the question I'm asking is whether the U.S.-China trade war diverted trade to Mexico. Um, and the idea is this is a natural experiment. It was a big change. Uh, many of the tariffs uh, increased by 25% on U.S. Uh, imports from China. So it was a very big shock. Um, it was basically random. Ahead of time, we did not know which products um, would be uh, hit with these tariffs. And so there's no way that China or Mexico could have gamed the system. And, and lastly, um, this, the, which products were hit with tariffs was largely, largely exogenous to Mexico's business conditions. So it wasn't as if the Trump administration decided to put tariffs on things where the market share was already shifting to Mexico. So you would have said, well, then you would say that it's not the result of the tariffs, it's actually a result of ongoing changes. So what we largely have here is a huge uh, natural experiment. We want to see what happened. Next slide, please. First, just looking at the raw data. Here, we're just looking at changes in U.S. import market share um, by product group and trade partner. And here, I'm just dividing all the products into two groups. Those that were hit with, uh, I'll call them Trump trade war tariffs, and those that were not. The blue bars are the Trump trade war tariff goods. And as you look across, you can see that U.S. Uh, market share in those goods for China fell by more than 4%. Who picked up some of that market share? You can see that Mexico was next in line. It increased its market share in tax goods by almost 2%. However, it also lost market share in untaxed products. And that tells you that in these trade flows, there's a lot of other things that are influencing uh, the amount by which each country trades with another. And so we have to include a set of controls to control for changes over time in which goods are U.S. imports more from everybody or for seasonality. And that's what we do in our statistical analysis. Next slide, please. 
So what we can see here is that Mexico's share of U.S. imported uh, goods imports uh, varies a lot by sector. Of course, the sector in which uh, Mexico has the largest uh, share is transportation equipment, as has been uh, mentioned before. But next, and perhaps surprisingly for some folks, is electrical equipment, appliances, and components, and then computer and electronic products. We often think of our computer products as coming from Asia, but Mexico has a significant market share in that, as well as in other types of uh, mineral products, metal products, primary metals, and machinery. So what we see when we look deep down into the trade data is that Mexico competes head to head with China in many sectors. Now, how did the trade, uh, the trade war affect uh, Mexico's imports to the United States? Next slide, please. Controlling for these factors that I mentioned above, general changes in US demand uh, and supply uh, shifts, we see that um, some sectors increased um, quite a bit, but surprisingly, the winner, the one, this, the uh, sector that increased, uh, had the, sort of the, the biggest change uh, in sales to the United States was leather products. That's probably a little disappointing. Leather products is probably not viewed as the industry of the future by many governments. Uh, but we also see that electrical equipment, appliances, and components increased, as did computer and electronic products, areas where Mexico may clearly become uh, an important supplier for the United States. Now, one of the problems is that, or problems, if you are Mexico, is that this, how much trade was diverted to Mexico depends on how much of, uh, say, computer uh, and electronic products imports from China the Trump administration decided to tax. And in fact, in this sector, despite this being the most important part of the US-China relationship, 35% of our imports from China fall into this basket. The Trump administration chose to tax it relatively lightly. Only about 40% of the value of those imports were actually taxed. People will remember that they didn't tax uh, laptops, Apple watches, phones, et cetera, which are, have by, by value are very important in the sector. So even given that they taxed um, less than half of the sector, Mexico did see an increase in 4% um, in its sales to the US. So I think there is some evidence here that Mexico is viable as an alternative, given the size of the tariffs that were levied on China, 25%. We can be a little disappointed that the increase wasn't more, but next slide, please. Um, it's going to take time. So just reviewing the main conclusions of our analysis, could the tariffs have diverted trade to Mexico? Yes, clearly, because China and Mexico compete in many products. Um, how much did U.S. imports from Mexico of tax goods rise? About 1.6%, um, but the market share fell in others. When we actually control for uh, a host of other factors, we find that U.S. tariffs on China increased the overall value of U.S. imports from China by 3.4%. Um, and the, it excuse me, the industries that really benefited most are leather products, electrical equipment, and electrical products. Next slide, please. So I think that in looking at this evidence we have, we have to realize that change will be slow because investments are sticky. Uh, many of the imports that we're looking at from China are the result of foreign direct investment into China. Moving those investments is going to take time. Now that it's clear, well, it seems clear that these tariffs are not going to be repealed at any time. Remember, during the Trump administration, it was very unclear when or how the tariffs would be handled, um, not only uh, as a new administration came in, but as the Trump uh, phase one deal. Now that the Biden administration seems to uh, be leaving them in place, uh, businesses may begin to look at relocation and moving supply chains uh, more seriously. Uh, it's important to remember that it's not only direct investment that guides these flows, it's also subcontracting. And here's where things like rule of law and ability to settle business disputes, corruption, and many of the other factors that are mentioned in the other papers really take hold. Um, Subcontracting, particularly in areas where products are highly differentiated, like in electronics, electronic products, 
uh, it develop, they require the development of successful and long-term contracting relationships. This is costly and time consuming for firms and they need to know what uh, the uh, legal um, and, and um, bilateral relationship would be and have confidence that that will be sustained and not changed in a new administration. Lastly, we see that transportation or trade costs are composed of more than tariffs. They're also affected by transportation costs. Many of the other uh, speakers and uh, contributions to this volume mention the importance of infrastructure development, not only in Mexico, but linking our two countries, um, raising or lowering the time to market, improving communication and legal costs, reducing corruption, and increasing security all along the, 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 the supply chain. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Dr. Lovely, um, for your opening remarks. I wanna go back uh, to you right away, uh, Dr. Lovely, and, and also bring in Dr. De La Calle. But before I ask my question, I want to remind viewers that if you've got a question, uh, go ahead and click on that Ask Live question button on the event page. We'll be collating questions for uh, Q&A uh, in, a, in a bit. But, but first, some moderated discussion. Uh, Dr. Lovely and, and Dr. De La Calle, You've both mentioned uh, how this is going to take time. And uh, Dr. De La Calle, you've talked about a window of opportunity to do some of the things that you mentioned, logistics, infrastructure, uh, inter an integrated energy market, technology. Uh, Dr. Lovely, you've mentioned how things are, are, are investments are sticky. When we talk about the nearshoring moment, what are we talking about in terms of a time frame here, in your opinion? So first, Dr. Lovely, and then uh, Dr. De La Calle. Um, I think there needs to be, I hate to say it, but almost a 10-year window where firms feel they can adequately forecast what the political environment would be. And a lot of this is investment in infrastructure and people, but it's also political risk. And that's something that that could be removed in the relationship under the right conditions, obviously. But I think it's about a 10 year window um, where firms need to have a, a clear sense of what the rules are. It's important. You know, we all talk about what's going on in China, uh, increased uh, statist approach. Um, we see what seems like rather abrupt regulation, particularly uh, in the tech sphere. And yet this year, as our colleague, as our colleague uh, Nick Lardy has um, said and written about, foreign direct investment flows into China will break all records this year. Um, so if, if things are so bad, why is so much foreign investment going in? A lot of the times it is because China is transactional. This is the deal. And firms can deal with certainty. They can't deal with uncertainty. Uh, companies that don't like the deal won't go in, but those that do and see the ability to make a profit will, and they'll create jobs. And so I think that um, we need to have a, a, a more certain business environment uh, over this time horizon. Great, thank you, Dr. Lovely. And I'll, I'll go to you, Dr. De La Calle. Do you agree that it's about a 10 year window for firms to feel comfortable moving uh, their, their supply chains, given that, that importance? and I'll, I'll give you an additional question based on the four things that you mentioned, the logistics, the infrastructure, integrated energy market and technology. Is that a big enough window for Mexico to get these things right? Well, I mean, 10, ten years sounds about right. Um, but I mean, it, this is a continuum. It's not discrete. It's not, it's not like you wait 10 years and then it happens. It's happening already. When people say that Mexico, as Job was saying in some of the uh, uh, indices for international organizations, that Mexico, I mean, is a middle mid-level country in terms of competitiveness, that's a little uh, deceiving in the sense that there's, there are many Mexicos. Uh, you have you have areas of Mexico that are tremendously competitive, and you have areas of Mexico that are tremendously uncompetitive, or sectors within the Mexican economy that are not very competitive, others that are. If you look at uh, the regions that benefited from the NAFTA in the last 30 years, they are already benefiting from diversification of Chinese risk. I mean, do look at um, Prologis, the largest industrial park concern around the world, Vesta, which is the second largest in Mexico, um, uh, and many others. They are their public companies, they publish their numbers. They have their industrial parks running in, in northern Mexico at 100%. 
employment levels in the, the whole border region, border states in Mexico are be above pre-COVID levels. Some of the investment numbers that um, uh, are published will be uh, upgraded in the next few years, and, and we'll, we'll realize that investment is actually larger than, than it has. And, 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 and as Mary was saying, the fact that Mexico gains one or two percent of the U.S. market to China uh, appears to be insignificant. One percent of the U.S. market is humongously large. I mean, South Korea has 2% of the U.S. market. So 1% is half of South Korean exports. Uh, so these apparently marginal gains that Mexico is getting um, can be very significant in terms of jobs and in terms of containers and in terms of trade flows. The, the main cost is an opportunity cost. And Mexico is failing to take advantage of that window. And, and, the, and you can also influence the size of the window. I mean, if, if Mexico makes itself attractive, the window will be larger and will remain open longer. If, uh, if, you, don't, if you do nothing or you make things that are counterproductive, then you shrink the size of the window and you shorten the length of the openness of that window. So, so it is up to Mexico. To, to really decide whether this, uh, I mean, China took advantage of uh, open trade uh, 30 years ago in a way that nobody expected it would. Mexico has benefited from NAFTA in the last 30 years. Absolutely, yes. The USMCA has a tremendous potential, but I mean, it's going to be technological. And to be technologically advanced and to make a technological contribution for Mexico, we need to move and become a more modern country. And that means, of course, the rule of law. And, and building the rule of law takes time, more than 10 years, unfortunately. If I could just follow up really quickly here, Dr. De La Calle, of, the, of some of the things that you've mentioned, uh, the Lopez Obrador administration has come up multiple times in our conversation, um, obviously. Uh, what do you think is the most politically feasible thing that could get done between now and the end of the of the AMLO sexenio in 2024? Well, well, um, I mean, if you talk to uh, businessmen in Mexico, they will tell you uh, defense. Let's uh, prevent the destroying of institutions as much as we can in the last, in the next three years. I think that the Biden administration and the Lopez Obrador administration should develop an agenda uh, to link southern Mexico and northern Central America to the east coast of the U.S. The numbers Mary was quoting in terms of market shares in the U.S. is mostly <clears throat> centered of the U.S., the heartland, the uh, Midwest, and, and west from Texas to California. Mexico and Central America have very small market share in the east coast. So if we open up a logistical uh, maritime links between the Yucatan Peninsula and, uh, and the Florida and uh, Mobile, Alabama, uh, we could put Chiapas, which is a poor state in southern Mexico bordering Guatemala, in, two, in 72 hours of New York City. So developing the logistics to open up the East Coast to Central America and Southern Mexico is the agenda that I think that the Biden administration and the Lopez administration should pursue, because that, that is compatible, perfectly compatible with their view that not everybody benefited from NAFTA, which is true. But the reason they didn't is because in those states, we didn't have logistics, we didn't have energy, we didn't have technology, and we didn't have rule of law. Thank you very much, Dr. De La Calle. Mariana, I want to go to you and um, you mentioned in your opening remarks the the investor dis, uh, dispute settlement process uh, that was left in the in the energy uh, sector in the USMCA agreement. You've mentioned some other things that the U.S. can do uh, to to nudge Lopez Obrador in the right direction. Um, but as we we both know, Lopez Obrador can be uh, very stubborn. Uh, he's a defender of Mexican sovereignty, and so um, I want to ask you, how do you think U.S. policymakers can uh, can cooperate with Mexican federal, state, and local governments to institute the type of policy changes 
that you think are necessary in Mexico to make it a more viable partner. Um, and I'll also ask you, uh, is the high level economic dialogue that's currently ongoing between Mexico and the United States recently relaunched? Is it the best spot for some of these conversations to take place? You're, you're muted, Mariana. I'm sorry, typical. Um, to answer the first part of your question first, uh, what can the US and Mexico do to cooperate? Um, I, I mean, as, as Luis has said, in Mexico is many Mexicos, right? We have the north of Mexico, which is more educated, has more infrastructure, and has a very strong, powerful manufacturing base. However, southern Mexico, which is really people that voted for uh, the Lopez Obrador administration, and it is also the people that would probably benefit the most if we were able to integrate uh, the United States and Mexico. Uh, I think there is an opening there if the United States could just make Mexico understand that if by integrating into the United States, the people that Lopez Obrador is trying to govern for, which is the poorest people of the country, they would certainly benefit the most. Luis already mentioned sort of the integration uh, with, the, with, the, with the Northeast of the United States, and that would require tremendous investment in energy, tremendous investment in the rule of law. These are, con these are states in Mexico that probably don't have um, enough roads, they don't have enough electricity, they don't have, uh, they don't have many of the important things, and education. The people in those parts of the country are the, probably the less educated people. Uh, so I, you know, I believe Lopez Obrador administration's policies are hurting the people he's trying to help. So that, that if, if the United States and Mexico were cooperate in very pragmatical ways, we could have a chance. The problem is that ideology is overpowering. Uh, and um, and I think that the United States can can have like a pre quo pro quo approach with this administration. That is, we have I believe we have been wasting some opportunities to force Mexico to do certain things. Uh, I believe that in Mexico the the Biden administration is being perceived probably as weaker, and even in this so important thing for this administration, which is energy and the environment, the fact that there has been no approach by the Biden administration to this administration to, you know, to sort of to, 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 to give a pushback, it is being interpreted by many, even in the Mexican Congress, that, okay, if the United States doesn't do anything, we can go ahead. So I, I believe taking a more aggressive approach more proactive approach. I mean, I'm certainly not advocating for um, for tariffs, but in 2018, when the Trump administration threatened tariffs in order to influence the policies of Mexico regarding migration, they were able to come up with a mutually beneficial approach. I certainly believe that the United States has a lot of leverage that can be used to have a very pragmatic one by one element that at least will allow us to pass these three years uh, and, and as Luis said, be defensive and instead of offensive. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Jeff Schott, uh, last but not least, I wanna come to you and, and ask you, um, you mentioned very clearly in your opening remarks that the door is open, but Mexico has to walk through it. And I would add uh, to this discussion that the U.S. has to walk through it as well. And, and you touched on that a little bit in, in your remarks. Uh, so perhaps grabbing Mexico by the hand and, and walking through the door uh, together. And your essay talks about how the USMCA, uh, in your opinion, casts a, a cloud over this potential uh, a reshoring of, of supply chains. And so uh, I want to ask you, um, what is it that we can be doing better on on our side of the border to lubricate some of this uh, uh, this nearshoring? Because there have been many bills uh, in the Congress, there have been many pronouncements 
many people in Washington thinking about this. Uh, what are your thoughts on what we can do on, on our side of the border to facilitate or to- I'm sorry, you're freezing up, Ryan. This movement. Let me, I'm uh, sorry, I froze. Uh, let, me, let me ask you again. Uh, there, there's been a lot of discussion in Washington um, and there have been many bills in Congress about this as well, things that the U.S. might be able to do on our side of the border to lubricate or to facilitate some of this movement. And I ask you because you mentioned, you know, it's a door that Mexico has to walk through. And I would add that it's a door that Mexico has to walk through with the United States. Uh, and so I'll just ask you to, to make some comments on what we can do on our side of the border, uh, what we can do better and what we can do to facilitate and lubricate some of this uh, movement of, of supply chains. Well, it's it's a very important question, uh, but it has very significant, substantial constraints, uh, and uh, it's it's for the reasons that uh, Luis uh, pointed out. Uh, Mexico and and Mariano mentioned this as well. Uh, Mexican development has been very uneven. You can go back thirty years to the start of NAFTA. Uh, to the negotiation of NAFTA, and Luis will remember, part of the uh, objective was to develop incentives to promote private sector investment, in uh, not just in the north of Mexico, but throughout the country, to provide incentives for uh, value-added manufacturing, to create jobs, uh, to build the infrastructure. Uh, because of various macro shocks, the money wasn't there. Uh, to build the infrastructure, and therefore there was a lot of uh, uh, disincentive or a lack of incentives for the private sector to work with government, even when the government was taking a, 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 a more favorable position or supportive position of private enterprise. Uh, that's not the case now, and the, the resources available for uh, from the pro from the public sector are going to be it's going to be very difficult to come to uh, bring together the types of money needed for the massive infrastructure development uh, that uh, uh, would would support the the useful ideas that Luis has put forward in terms of developing uh, southern regions of Mexico, uh, and that's on top of the. Uh, concerns that haven't been uh, mentioned in this program that came up in your fine essay uh, dealing with the security problems. Uh, and how do you uh, make sure that uh, there is physical human security uh, uh, on the uh, logistical networks that uh, will link our two countries? So this is a 30 year, we've dug ourselves a 30 year hole uh in, in terms of economic development in 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 certain in, in important regions of Mexico important not economically today but important politically as Mariana has pointed out uh and so this is the resistance that you're going to get from the uh, Lopez Obrador administration because uh they are looking at what immediately can can help their uh their uh, uh constituents uh, and not looking at the 10 year window of, of building in the infrastructure to to attract the investment that will come in over time. That's the big challenge. And that's the cost that you pay for procrastination. And it, it's not just Mexico. Obviously, the United States is paying a big uh, price in terms of the procrastination on updating our own infrastructure and ports and airports and roads and bridges. Um, and suddenly the bill for, for doing it is so great that it has tied the U.S. Congress up in knots. Uh, that's hurting our competitiveness. Uh, there are ways that Mexico could su be supporting us if they had the, uh, the ability to, to diversify the uh, logistical network. Uh, and, and, and what Luis is saying is, is exactly right develop uh, new uh, uh, channels for transporting goods from Mexico to the east coast of the United States. Uh, and, but that's hard to do. It's, it's easy to prescribe, but, but hard to do. And it'd be interesting to see if there are new programs. Uh, but even the, the NADBank, even if we got 
everything we we asked for in terms of expanded NAD bank resources would only begin to to scrape the uh, uh, the uh, the problem or deal with the problems that we're, uh, we're facing after 30 years of neglect. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, you mentioned the, the NAD bank and, and some of the things that it can do. I'm wondering if as an editor of, of the volume itself, if you feel comfortable just giving a quick overview of, the, of that essay, you mentioned mine on security. I think it's really that essay by Sherman Robinson was, was really uh, interesting. Uh, a lot of people might not have even heard of, of the NAD bank. So Give us a quick uh, overview of, of that essay and, and what, what's being proposed in terms of the role that it can play, how it can fill some of those gaps. Well, the North American Development Bank, or, or NAD Bank, uh, was introduced around the time of, NAD, uh, of the NAFTA uh, with the purpose of building political support on uh, primarily on the U.S. side of the border to get the votes in Congress uh, to pass the NAFTA, a very close vote in uh, uh, in 1993, uh, uh, but essentially to buy some votes in Texas and, uh, and a few other states. Uh, it, it was undercapitalized from the beginning, $3 billion, uh, but even more uh, uh, problematic was the constraints that were put on the activities, on, on the types of, of projects that the NAD Bank could support uh, to sort of catalyze private sector investment. Uh, a lot went into wastewater treatment plants, but much more needed to be done, uh, not only in the border region, but uh, across the Mexican economy uh, and getting into more types of, you know, uh, constructive infrastructure projects. Uh, and supporting infrastructure in, uh, uh, to promote renewable energy which should be something the, the Biden administration should want and to promote solar and wind power in, in, in Mexico. Uh, but that gets uh, discouraged because of the energy policies being pursued by the Lopez Obrador administration uh, and, and the, the dominant role of, of, of uh, state-owned uh, companies. So there, there are a lot of concerns, uh, but in terms of something positive the United States could do right away, yes, uh, boosting uh, NADBank, uh, expanding its scope, uh, making it a truly bipartisan, uh, a binational uh, enterprise that, that uh, promotes activities uh, throughout Mexico that will benefit North American economic integration and jobs in both our countries, I think would be very important. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on the uh, on the on the visa issue, which is also a very important and constructive idea uh, that uh, that was put forward. But uh, that gets that gets into a whole big other area. Uh, we maybe need another another program just on that topic. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think that is uh, that's the subject of a, of a different webinar. Um, we're going to move to uh, Q and A now, with about uh, 18 minutes left in our programming here this this morning. We're getting some questions coming in, and just as a final reminder to our viewers, if you want to click on, uh, if you want to ask a question, rather, you can go to the website, click on Ask Live Questions, uh, and we're collating those questions now. Uh, the first one comes in. Uh, it's about China and its um, foreign and investment policy in Southeast Asia, which as we've mentioned, is one of the, the chief competitors uh, to Mexico in terms of uh, supply chain relocation. And it says, considering China's current aggressive foreign policy in Southeast Asia and around the world, is, anticipating, is anticipated US-China decoupling more of a political or an economic question? Uh, how do other countries view such economic decoupling and will they follow a similar policy as the United States? I think this one is, is squarely in Dr. Lovely's wheelhouse here. So uh, Dr. Lovely, if you don't mind answering that one. Sure. Um, decoupling is uh, just not happening. <laughs> it's it's a nice perhaps term for political purposes, but it's, it's not happening. Uh, much of the rest of the world is actually much more deeply embedded into China than it was uh, eight years ago. Uh, so um, what I think many many countries in Asia are looking for is a balancing, uh, which would suggest the importance of a continued American presence in Asia, 
our withdrawal from the CPTPP was a major disappointment for the region, um, and we have yet to replace it with anything substantive. So I think right now, we, uh, a lot hangs in the balance, and I think that we have seen that we have lost a lot of ground in the last five years, uh, and we're, the clock is continuing to tick in the Biden administration. So what is going to be the U.S. policy? What is the U.S. going to offer these countries uh, in terms of an economic policy, which is, of course, key to the relationship with many of these countries? I would also say that China did move um, some of its factories, for example, to Vietnam, uh, to the extent that it, uh, you know, unbolted machinery, put it on a boat and shipped it across. Um, but that Vietnam itself has had trouble dealing with the inflow of investment, finding uh, the appropriate sites for factories, um, dealing with the incredible demand in terms of communications and logistics that was thrust upon it, uh, acquiring adequate workers uh, for these factories. So, um, you know, it was in some sense a, a, a bounty that was unexpected, hard to deal with. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that it also shows how quickly these supply chains can move under the right conditions. All that could be moved back to China. And I think uh, Vietnam knows that. They're looking to the United States for a more long-term partnership uh, to balance against its relationships with China. Um, the U.S. just uh, simply isn't there right now. Thank you, Dr. Lovely. Uh, we've had a question come in about supply chain relocation to South American countries. I think that's a little bit outside the scope of this uh, conversation, but I will direct a similar question at uh, Dr. De La Calle because throughout our conversation, you've referred to uh, Southern Mexico and, and the Northern Triangle countries and how they might be uh, integrated as well. So uh, why don't we turn the question into what are the main obstacles for achieving similar supply chain uh, relocations uh, to to that part of Mexico as well as the Northern Triangle countries are they are they similar or are they different than some of the main obstacles you outlined in your opening statement? Well, um, the, the, before answering that, I would say complementing uh, Mary's uh, answer before, uh, the, I mean, decoupling will not happen in the sense that you just stop trading with China. That will not happen. Here we're talking about diversification of Chinese risk. And, and if that diversification means that uh, Mexico gets 10% of the investment that used to go to China, 10% would be tremendously large. Uh, I mean, we, we wouldn't have enough industrial parks to host 10% of the invest of the investment going to China. So, um, I mean, so you have to think in that way. Uh, South America, uh, uh, China sees South, South America as a source of commodities. Mexico is a source of manufacturing. Uh, we benefit from high manufacturing prices and we benefit from low commodity prices. South America works the other way around. So you, you will never see, a, unless Brazil changes its policies, a, a large manufacturing base for worldwide sales in South America. That will not happen. There is the, the, the infrastructure is not there. Um, the uh, the way business works in South America will not produce that. And they don't have the inputs to do it. The question for Central America and the Caribbean, including Haiti, for instance, or uh, the Dominican Republic, is whether you can create a critical mass of uh, insourcing of the necessary inputs to be truly competitive, particularly on textiles. And, and uh, the, the rule of origin of the NAFTA and then CAFTA that was tremendously restrictive. I think it worked in the reverse uh, way that people were expecting. By restricting the sourcing, you made uh, competitiveness of parallel producing in those uh, countries impossible. Uh, so um, if, if you um, want to make Central America and Southern Mexico truly competitive, uh, the first thing you have to do is make sure that you have one logistics so that goods goods can come out, but also inputs can come in, and that you have global sourcing. It's very interesting, for instance, to, to look at um, the, the to know that Me Mexico's largest export sector is electronics, advanced electronics, and in advanced electronics, the, the NAFTA has no value because duties are zero. 
on inputs and on, on, the, on the final products. So in the sector that we have grown, grown the most is where we face the most competition from China and where, where we have global sourcing. If you apply the same arguments for uh, textile and apparel in the Caribbean, in Central America and Southern Mexico, you will be successful. Because the, the, the advantage China has on textiles is that a Chinese firm can present to, say, Walmart a, 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 a set of um, girl uh, children clothing with colors, with uh, zippers, buttons, design. They are so rich in a variety that they can change it every season. If you produce with North American textiles in Central America or, or Southern Mexico, you will have no variety uh, and Walmart will not buy from you. So opening to sourcing and logistics are, are the key. Uh, high duties will help a little, but in the end, they will not help. They will hurt. Thank you, Dr. De La Calle. I have a question that's come in that I think would be a, a good fit for, uh, for Jeff, because you've mentioned uh, green energy uh, in your response to mine about, about the NADBank and, and clean energy investments, um, and that uh, dovetailing quite nicely with the Biden administration's agenda in Latin America. Uh, the question is, what, what would be the role and the potential impact of green and clean energy investment for Mexico uh, to be able to take advantage of this type of supply chain opportunity with the United States? So talk a little bit more about the role of, of some green investments uh, in, uh, in Mexico and, and how that might dovetail with the supply chain relocation agenda. Well, I, I think ultimately it's a question about uh, the competitiveness of the electricity sector in Mexico. And uh, Mariana was talking about it, Luis was talking about it. Uh, and it, it's very difficult with the, a, a, the direction that regulation is moving to encourage these types of investments in alternative energy supplies. Uh, uh, we had a hard fight uh, a decade or two ago in, in, in pro providing new channels for gas pipelines uh, to, to integrate uh, the energy networks of our two countries. Uh, we still have insufficient uh, interconnection uh, of the electricity grids. Uh, so, uh, and then the promotion of more energy uh, to uh, uh, and cleaner energy uh, that could uh, have a benefit for Mexican producers, more reliable uh, supplies of energy uh, that inhibits uh, uh, investment in some regions. I think that would all be a big plus. Uh, but not under not not in the uh, in the way that the uh, energy regulation is moving in uh, uh, in Mexico. It's a little like uh, the disincentives to uh, uh, clean energy investments uh, that occurred as the Trump administration turned U.S. Uh, energy regulations inside out in favor of fossil fuels. So uh, we're we're uh, reversing some of that in the United States, but in Mexico they seem to be. Uh, uh, pursuing a policy that that is not going to be helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our our last question that's come in is about USMCA, and I want to give it to Mariana. Um, it says, uh, is there an an opportunity to revise or, or improve upon the USMCA given some of the drawbacks that we've discussed in this webinar today, uh, and what would be the the consequences of that in the future? Thank you very much, Ryan. Luis, I think you're the expert on this, so I'm going to have to pass it to you completely. Well, I mean, let me let me say something about the USMCA. Uh, the 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 North America will be successful tomorrow if we set the standards and develop the new products, the, the products of the future. The rules of origin that were drafted in the uh, pressure from the US and from the US steel industry. Um, uh, on autos and auto parts in the USMCA, we're trying to protect the cars of the past. The cars of the future will not be electric, they will be electronic. The large companies producing cars will be not only the GMs and the Chryslers of the world, but the Foxcoms, large electronic firms. 
And, and North America has this tremendous opportunity to uh, set the standards of the future for the electronic cars. And then, of course, the Internet of Things and, and push for the digital economy. The, the, the success of the USMCA, the USMCA will be digital. Uh, I mean, the, the success of NAFTA was industrial first and then agri, agri, agriculture. That will continue with the Chinese uh, restructuring, it will continue more, no? because North America uh, manufacturing will continue to grow. But the future is in, in, elect in, uh, in, in, uh, in the realm of ideas, uh, in, in designing the, the, the products of the future. So uh, my prediction is that in the same way that uh, we dumped the rule of origin on uh, uh, TV sets, when we negotiated, Jeff will remember this, when we negotiated the uh, NAFTA, a TV set was North American if the picture tube was North American. Well, the, the young people listening to us, they don't know what a picture tube is. Uh, so we had to dump the rule of origin. Well, the same thing will happen with cars because the, this idea that, that internal combustion uh, with no software or little software uh, represents the, the future is completely false. So in, in North America, we should uh, strive to develop the, uh, the uh, economy of the future through uh, working on molecular bi biology, on the digital economy, on robotics, on the cars of the future, of the Internet of Things. That's where the future lies. And the question for Mexico is, do we want to participate in that? Well, then invest in brains. Brown is fine. Brains are better. Uh, and, and that implies, of course, education, research, uh, creativity, ingenuity, gastronomy. Mexico has significant cultural comparative advantage that we should bring to bear in our competition with China. And, and we can, I think, will succeed in spite of governments, even though the window might close. In the end, it will happen. Thank you for that set of comments, uh, Dr. De La Calle. I want to give in the uh, four minutes that we have remaining, I want to give each of you a minute to make any sort of closing or concluding remarks that you'd like uh, and to discuss something that you think was was left on the table or, or something that we didn't cover sufficiently. And I'll start with you, Mariana, um, and then go to Dr. Lovely and, and around before we conclude. Sorry about that. Um, I, you know, just to conclude, and I think in my in my previous answer, I was not as clear as this, is that the United States and Mexico is the most integrated country in the world. I mean, the crossings between our borders are the highest in the world. We have people that, and communities and societies that are actually not US or Mexico, but they live together. So the cooperation between the two countries is not only at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. We have to improve our security cooperation, our border cooperation, our narco-trafficking trade. You know, unfortunately, we have that issue that is hurting armed flows. I mean, we do have a lot of issues between the two countries that are not unresolved. And right now, the cooperation and the trust has been broken. To me, the most important thing is to try at least to be pragmatic and to find those ways in which the two countries can cooperate in order to prevent from this relationship to deteriorate more. Thank you very much, Mariana. Over to you, Dr. Lovely, for a couple succinct remarks, a couple concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, it's been such a rich conversation. Um, I would just like to kind of spring off on what um, Luis just mentioned about the industries of the future and uh, what we see in China with uh, its industrial policy. As the US and other countries turn to create their own industrial policies, uh, we at Peterson and many other voices are urging the Biden administration to think in terms of working with allies uh, and broadening it out. And of course, there are forces against that, such as Buy America provisions and other types of provisions that focus on reshoring as opposed to nearshoring. So I think that the two countries need to include among the long list of things that we've suggested they need to cooperate on and increase trust is developing 
uh, industrial policies very broadly uh, framed, including the long list of things that Luis mentioned, such as talent um, and basic education, uh, with a view toward having those industries uh, really here in North America, as opposed to in just the United States or just Mexico. So I would urge cooperation uh, in terms of this movement that we're seeing right now uh, in terms of industrial policy and its link to supply chains. Thank you very much, Dr. Lovely. Over to you, Jeff Schott, for your concluding remarks. Well, I think following on what uh, what Mariana and, and Mary and, and Luis said before, uh, the, 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 the challenge is to go back to the initial vision of North American economic integration, uh, working together uh, to strengthen our competitiveness uh, on a global basis. Uh, and we've taken steps from time to time, as Luis said, that uh, have actually uh, run at cross purposes to our, our objectives in textiles, in automobiles and the like. Uh, Mexico actually has a, a, an opportunity to do more if it, if it uh, re, realigns its own domestic policies to in, in, encourage more productive enterprise, because Mexico is in the TPP, the, the revised TPP, the United States is not. And so it has the opportunity to use that agreement to encourage uh, uh, activities, initiatives across the Asia Pacific region to come to Mexico. Uh, as Luis said, you know, you just take a small portion of the investment into China or, or, or the activity of market share of Korea in North America and move that to Korea, uh, to Mexico, and it's a big deal. Uh, and there is an open channel to do that. Mexico was wise to get in, uh, but now it has to do the work to uh, take advantage of the open doors that it has across the Asia Pacific, uh, not just uh, in North America. And I think those are the two recipes that will uh, uh, lead over time to some success, but it, it has to require a political will to do that. And unfortunately, uh, that's something that seems to be in short supply in North America. Thank you very much, Jeff. Lastly, Dr. De La Calle, your concluding remarks. Well, I just will say that, um, well, thank you for the invitation, of course. Um, the, the high level economic dialogue and the meetings with Vice President uh, Kamala Harris on that are very important. Um, the uh, Biden administration appears to be paralyzed because of the migration threat. And uh, in, in front of large migration flows, they think they cannot push the AMLO administration to do something that is right. I think they're mistaken. The, what the Mexican government needs is a little nudging from the US to do the right thing. And, 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 and I think if the U.S. presents a, an ambitious program for economic development, Mexico will follow. Um, I wish it was the other way around, that would, it would be Mexico proposing something ambitious to the U.S. But I mean, with this administration, I think it's better to try to nudge uh, the Biden administration to be a little bolder, not appear weak, and to put a little pressure on the Mexican administration to do what's right for everybody. And the main beneficiaries, as Mariana was saying, are precisely the people that Lopez Obrador is trying to help in Mexico. Thank you very much, Dr. De La Calle. Uh, thank you uh, to our friends at the Peterson Institute and CSIS, Americas and, and Econ program. This has been a fantastic collaboration. I've certainly enjoyed being a part of it. And I want to take one last second to remind viewers before we wrap up the event that there's a compendium of really excellent essays that we've mentioned at various points throughout this event uh, that I would encourage you all to, to go to the CSIS or to the Peterson Institute website. You can access it there and, uh, and read it. But this is a very timely set of issues, and I think it's clear that it's not the last time we'll be talking about this. And so I've thoroughly enjoyed this cooperation, and I hope that we can do so again in the future. Thank you all for attending very much.